let's put ourselves in the toughest situations possible. Let's blood. Let's prepare very well worst case scenarios. Let's pet test skills and ability claims in the most egregious environments. Those environments that definitively do not support us. Let's be before we act. In other words, let's have the correct posture, the correct physical, and by correct I mean effective and functional, physical presence in the environment. Let's have the ability to embrace fully what is, not what we wish it should be, what we'd hope it should be, what it could be in the best possible circumstances. They don't exist. We have to love and embrace what's right there in front of us, no matter how terrible it is. That determines that we have hard bark on ourselves, very hard bark. You only get that hard bark by climbing through or scratching through or crawling through, I like that better, 500 yards of pure shit, of pure hell, of pure torment, of pure opposition, yes, of pure negativity. And it's the opinion of the stranger that negativity, positivity, if there's any, has to be mined. And it's mined out of negativity. You've got to be, be able to say, I am set, I'm ready for anything that may come up. I don't care what it is. I'm set and ready, I'm prepared. I'm not intimidated by it because I know what to do. I've practiced so much. I've never missed an opportunity to rehearse and practice, particularly unrehearsed situations. After you've done a lot of simulated mock-ups, where you made those simulated mock-ups as tough as possible, you pose the toughest possible questions you can to yourself. In other words, you are a your own accomplice to exposing yourself. You walk in willingly to the hellfire of being exposed in the light of day, in the bright sunlight for what you are. You walk in willingly to face those nights of the mirrors in the bright sunlight. That's where you're in the center circle. And each night tells you what they see. They don't have a dog in the hunt. And they are fully objective, fully ruthless in what in their objectivity. You are exposed all the way around the circle, every way you turn. But not only are you exposed, you can see exactly in the mirror what the knights are talking about. They can, you can see the foolishness of your behavior that you are not aware of when you're in a social situation. It takes a lot of experience and a lot of time, and I'm the one to know about it, before you can learn how to project, how to effectively and safely read the other person and read the social situation and know the legal aspects and the social aspects and the dangers involved and the traps. It takes a long time to learn the vaunted art of communication how to be effective and safe in the communication, how not to trigger responses, how to, how to know how to effectively diffuse a bad situation and do so safely and effectively. It takes a long time. You see, these gurus or these self-help talking heads, they spout out admonitions, pithy sayings, but they do don't realize, they never ask themselves, they say it in general, and everything they're saying is generally unchallengeable, unchallengeable, undebatable. It's trivially true. It's perfectly true until it gets down to the individual human reality who has to understand it. He has to apply it. He needs the tools. 
He needs the self-mastery and the ability to use those tools under massive pressure, massive stress, and to deal with it. That requires him to be have tremendous stamina and endurance. Now we're getting back down to that training. Now we're getting back down to that physical fitness. You've got to be strong, and I'm talking about brute functional strength. You've got to have presence. I'm talking about your posture and the speed, alertness, physical alertness that's required, the focus and determination that's your being projects before you even say anything or do anything. I found that without that you won't survive and you won't be teachable and reachable. Where well, we make the mistake is we're looking for somebody to do it for us. We're looking for somebody to take the hand and do it for us. But each has their own. None has the time. And the operative question right here is, hey, what's in it for me? Why should I? What's in it for me? What do I get out of this? Then comes the question of establishing rapport. And Tony Robbins is correct when he says you don't get anything. You don't get the answers you need. You don't get the confirmations that, and acceptance that you need unless you can establish rapport. If you don't establish that rapport, all you'll get is very superficial politeness responses, very superficial politeness acceptance, very super, superficial politeness smiles that are empty, that a desperate, horny, lonely man can misconceive as being confirmations. You gotta clean the Aegean stables. The Aegean stables are all the shit, all the garbage that's in your mind and stored in your body attitude that must first be cleaned out, must be cleaned out and fumigated before anything new can come into replace it. That's a tough job. That's a tough job. And most of the time, we have to do it by trial and error. In short, by getting our asses whipped, whomped out there in the arena of confrontation and encounter that keeps changing and changes while you're in it. There's no formula. Because if you come in with a formula, you'll be rigid. You learn the formula. You watch the formula, but you don't follow the formula when you get out there. You have to be flexible, loose, adopt, and where you can change if you have the power to do it. That means the physical power, the material power, the connections, the preparation, in short, the grounding. There's no shame in running. There's no shame when you're overwhelmed and get the hell out of there. This was not my day. It's just like with, in a fight between Tyson and Galata. After the second round, Galata says, cut the gloves off, stop the fight. What do you mean stop the fight? It's a, there's an ongoing fight. Get out there for another round. He said, no, stop the fight. It's not my day. He understood. Galata understood. Maybe it was fear, whatever it was. He, didn't want, he knew he was taking a lot of punishment. He didn't want to take no more punishment. He knew he wasn't in the fight. And he said, hey, cut the gloves off. Or you could be a hero and take your beating like a man. What have you proven if you take your beating like a man for the entertainment of the house? That gets back to what we were talking about before until the monkey comes. The man accepted being in pillory, even put himself in pillory just so he can be in a cage, and naked and vulnerable and blamed for everything, but at least he can claim, hey, I was there where the action took place. I shook the hand 
of the man that got all the action. I shook his hand. And I'm going to go home and fantasize about what I've seen. I have a memory. I have a memory. I won. I have a memory. I have a memory. I heard a few stimulating phrases, sexual phrases and sexual behavior. I can remember this. When I masturbate in the penthouse, I can remember this and create my scenario, set up my pictures, my mental pictures, my physical pictures, put on my favorite porny and identify with the porn star I see before me and identify and think that those porno women are accessible to me when it's, in fact, it's just a business. These women are trained to be accessible, to present the illusion of accessibility. That meaning you can talk to them about anything with comfort. The normal woman is not like that. And particularly for a short, small, ridiculous-looking man such as myself. Now, why do I say that? Do I have an inferiority complex? Bullshit. I'm saying it to whoever listens to this. I have the credentials. I know what in the hell I'm speaking about. Because I am it. Answering the question, why in the hell should I listen to this ugly man talking to me? This old ugly man talking to me. Why the hell should I listen to him? What does he have to say that's of any value? And it's a legitimate question. People only listen to somebody that has an appearance, a personality, a swag, and a line of shit. A good line of shit. Well, this man, this stranger, has no line of shit. The only thing I have is the naked truth that I've experienced. And I say all this extemporaneously. I don't have any notes. I'm not reading from any prepared script. Everything I'm saying is extemporaneous. I'm not making it up as I go. I'm talking about the arena. I'm talking about confrontation. I'm talking about a Cold, hard reality, no matter how it's covered over. No matter how you try to soft sell it or politicize it or provide a lot of escapes from this reality. I heard one man say, you know, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. I said, well, what are you grateful about? I'm so grateful. My society, this society, gives me so many avenues of escape. If I'm feeling bad, I know where to go. The media, Hollywood, the marketplace will sell me a fetish, will sell me a facsimile, will sell me an illusion. I'll see the actors. If they're good actors, they'll sell it to me. And for an hour and a half or so, I identify with my heroes and say, man, Boy, if I do those behaviors, if I imitate, maybe I can get what they have. And that's their job, to make it look easy, to put the formula on. And we're all foolish enough, like me, to look for the formula. There was a movie with, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, Russell Crowe, Beautiful Mind. And where the students went to the math students and said, write me a formula, listen to this, write me a formula that will work every single time that I can apply with certainty when I'm trying to meet women and trying to be confirmed by women and trying to be accepted by women. Write me a formula that will work every single time, that will be indubitable, invariable, that will bring me the results I want every single time. And the only problem with that is Elliot Roger. I give you Elliot Roger, Isla Vesta, the day of retribution. 
as a consequence. Now, if you win the lotto, or if you don't win the lotto, then you arm yourself, according to Eliot, for the day of retribution. That is taking back the power, answering back with certainty the bullies. But what happens then? Collateral damage. You end up executing the wrong people. But you work, up, you work yourself into a campaign where you have no choice, where you're cornered. Like Elliot, you're small, you're pukey, you're puny, you're weak. You can't stand up to the bullies. You come from a very, very established, quote-unquote, good family. You're wearing your Gucci shirt, your Neiman Marcus slacks, your fancy shoes and your BMW, your fancy haircut. And you watch the brute, obnoxious jock coming in at a t-shirt and a skateboard, and he's taking all the tall blondes. This is Elliot's thinking, not mine. You understand that. Then it becomes understandable if he doesn't win the lotto. He can't live this way. He, can't, he doesn't want to eat the defeat. And they told him, get the hell out of Isla Vista, you you can't function socially here. And Elliot says, I don't want to be beat like that. Well, then he has two other alternatives. Win the lotto. Become a multimillionaire order overnight. Buy the mansion on a hilltop and come in a Lamborghini into the campus. Buy your way in. Materialize your way in. And from your mansion on a hilltop, mock and laugh at the obnoxious brute jocks who have mocked and laughed at you. Now, when you're in that stage or state of mind and you run that camp kind of campaign, the day of retribution is inevitable. Nobody looks at it that way, except for me, a stranger. You look the cold, hard facts directly in their face with a ruthless integrity and honesty. Get all the objectivity you can get on it. Turn it, so many different perspectives. Reframe it, reformulate it, rethink it. But most of all, go out there in that environment and ask a lot of questions, do a lot of observing, get a lot of input. Before you make a dramatic decision, Take the campaign apart that's going on in your mind. Take that campaign apart and challenge every bit of it. Nobody looks at it that way. You get a man like Stefan Milanou, and Stefan Milanou will run a moral, self righteous analysis. He sees good, he sees bad, he sees right, he sees wrong. And your stranger says, Bullshit. It all exists on a continuum, and it's all a sales pitch. Life is nothing but a sales pitch, period. But Stefan Milanou has all the answers, even before you have the questions. Then you go to evangels, even worse. Now, at least Stefan Milanou is correct when he says variety curve, 80-20. 20% of your cool guys are getting 80% of your most desirable women in action. 80% of your uncool guys, and worse, like me, ridiculous appearance, short, dumpy, we're fighting with other cool guys for 20%. That parodic curve exists. I don't care what society. I don't care if it's a social, perfect utopian socialist society. That 80-20 parody curve exists. It's a fact of life. It's a, what we call a factum brutum. Either you understand it and adopt yourself to it, or you go down, spiraling down. Now, once you understand it and adopt yourself to it, then you develop the physical 
presence and power. And it has to be brute power. It has to be functional power. It has to be core power. Then you understand the importance of perfect posture, especially if you're a short man like me. Short man like me is instantly visually disrespected. Period. Then you develop rhetorical skills and get it down to a gnat's ass. That's called the armament that you need to go out there and face your day. Don't do that, and you'll watch yourself being destroyed. Don't do that, and you got Elliot Roger in a day of retribution. That's your philosophy talking. That's what I say. What do you think? What do you say?